Greetings Church One friends. As you can see plainly, we're still needing to communicate online, but I'm glad we've been able to worship outside. It's great to be outside today. It's such beautiful weather and that's the way it's been when we've gathered on Sunday. So if you haven't done that yet, please, it's very safe, pleasant, and uh, it would be great to see familiar faces, especially your face, if you haven't been here. Thanks to Mike and Ed, one of the things that you've heard a few times in the past weeks is the question, what might you consider saying yes to at Church One this fall? When I heard that question, I heard it in relationship to the idea of community building, education, and service. And so it's all under the banner of things that would encourage our faith. We say yes to those things which would encourage our faith and how we can encourage one another's faith. Last week, Mike preached from Philippians 3 and challenged us to keep stretching toward growth in Christ. So I'll combine all that to say this, stretch to say yes to Jesus at Church One this fall. Ellen and I are grateful that we've said yes to the parables class that Jessica Harrington has been uh, teaching. She's doing a stellar job every Saturday morning. In fact, that class was the main reason I chose the text that I'm going to be preaching on today, because it's a parable. I might, I'm not sure I would have picked it if it hadn't been for that class. And that, the friends in that class actually took some time, extra time this past Saturday to help me study and prepare for this. So there are benefits to saying yes. Um, man, I'm also looking forward to what Mike Batley is going to do uh, starting uh, this coming Tuesday evening from 8 to 9.30. He's chosen a great book about the heart of Jesus. I mean, what more could you say yes to than wanting to read and know more about the heart of Jesus? Julie Pittis is doing the same thing, uh, encouraging women in these trying times. And of course, Lori and Helen um, are holding down the fort on the prayer evenings on Wednesday. So and I sound, I know starting out here, I'm sounding a little bit like a commercial, but it's for du a dual reason. And one is this, that we stick together, that we encourage and keep communicating what will help us stick together during times that threaten to pull us apart. And the second reason is that today's gospel lesson fits perfectly with the whole idea of saying yes to faith and growth in Christ. Last week, Mike's key word was stretch in a good way. Today, the key word is invitation. Because in Matthew 22, Jesus tells a parable, a story, a metaphor about a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son and he invited many people to it. We're gonna read it shortly and we have a special guest reader today. I know you're in suspense. But when you hear the word invitation, what comes to your mind? I can think of a range of responses in my life. Why didn't I get an invitation? Oh no, another wedding invitation? Honey, look what we've been invited to. And that's just on the receiving end. What about on the sending end? Anybody uh, experience a wedding uh, where you've had to have a wedding for your daughters? I have. And so some of the questions have sounded like, well, who should we invite? Or there's no way we're inviting them. Uh, or do we really have to invite them? But when you think about the word or the idea of an invitation, it's really quite inviting because it has an element of choice and freedom mixed in with some kind of decision that we have to finally make. When we get an invitation, we want to know three, ba three basic things. One, who's it from? Two, what's it about? And three, will we say yes or no in our RSVP? So I'm going to pray, and then after I pray, I'm going to ask our special guest reader to read from Matthew 22, 1 to 14, about an invitation from a king and the variety of responses of the invitees as well as the responses of the king in response to the responses. You got that? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would open our minds to understand your word as it's read and as it's preached. Seal it in a strong way into our hearts as we hear it. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. 
Well, hello, Church One. It's good to be with you, hanging out with George over here at the church today and got pressed into service, and I'm delighted to be able to read to you the scripture reading today from Matthew 22. Once more Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. He sent out other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Look, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen, and my fat calves, and have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it, and they went away, one to his farm and another to the business, and while the rest seized his slaves and mistreated them, and they killed them. The king was enraged, and he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and, and burned their city. And then he said to his slaves, The wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore into the main streets and invite everyone you find to come to the wedding banquet. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered all who they had found, both good and bad. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And he was speechless. And then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot, and throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. You know, we don't use sermon titles at Church One, but if I could title this message, it would be, How do you say no to a king? But there's an even more disturbing question to ask, because Jesus clearly starts out and says, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king. The king is compared to God. So another question is, how do you say no to God? But it happens all the time. One of the keys to interpreting the parables is to listen for shock value. To turn down, to turn down an invitation in Middle Eastern culture is highly insulting then and was uh, then and, and now. But to turn down an invitation from a wealthy and powerful king to whom people were probably socially and financially indebted was beyond insulting. This is a shame and honor cultural setting. And the people who heard the parable were floored because this simply would not happen. It's shocking. So in that shock, we can mine out some of our understanding of what Jesus was trying to say. And a question would have come to their minds too as they heard this parable. What kind of king is Jesus talking about? And we ask, what kind of God is this? What kind of God allows himself to be shamed to the nth degree, but keeps on inviting? Actually, in the first century, the invitation was received well in advance, kind of a save the date thing. But this day was the day of the celebration. And it was a courtesy reminder to people who already should have been prepared to receive the invitation. And now the invitees were being called, which in Greek means is, is the actual word, uh, uh, in, uh, or what we see as invite is actually the word called in Greek. And in the second invitation, it's not only called, but there's an imperative. It's like, compel them, tell them, command them to come. Great pains have been taken. The table's prepared. Come to the wedding feast for my son. Anybody who's taken the time to prepare a meal and has people not coming when it's ready knows the frustration. But the text says that they made light of it, literally took no notice, hardly gave it a thought. So the shocks just keep on coming as people are listening to this parable of Jesus. They not only disrespected the king by declining the invitation, they declined the, the servants. They didn't even give the servants a second look. Jesus deliberately told these kind of stories to shock people and to shock uh, us into understanding what the kingdom of God is like at another level. So the three questions I asked earlier, 
that we all have when an invitation comes our way will guide us in hearing Jesus speak perhaps today. Who's this invitation from? A God who patiently persists in continuing to extend his invitation to feast with him forever. A God who endures dishonor, disrespect, insults, hatred, and shame, but still keeps extending his courteous grace to unworthy invitees. The God of the two sons in the parable of the prodigal who holds out his arms to people who have made a mess of their life as well as to those who are trying to score points with God by an exemplary self-righteous existence. God's grace is not only amazing, it's shocking. That's who that inv the invitation's from. Here's the second thing. What's it about? It's about a party. It's about a wedding banquet. It's a celebration of honor because the king's son is getting married. In order for this to even take place, God had to go through incredibly costly lengths to prepare a place for you and me. If you ever have had to have a, have, had to have a wedding for your daughter, you know how costly it is. A banquet of a king was often a sign of triumph over one's enemies. And sprinkled, intertwined throughout the parables in the Gospels is, is Jesus' constant pronouncements of what's about to await him in Jerusalem. A cross, suffering beyond imagination, both physical and spiritual. But it was also a triumph over hostile forces. You know, when Jesus said in John 14, I go to prepare a place for you. He wasn't going off with hammer and nails to build something. The place that he was providing was because the hammer and the nails were used on him so that you could have a place at his kingdom table. The cross made it possible to be with God forever. And you and I have been invited and are always being invited to a joyful reality. But like the initial invitees, it seems we believe that there's more delight sometimes in our own pursuits in this life. And so we exchange joy for lesser things. So it's from God. It's about a banquet that costs a lot. And the third thing is, the third concern with an invitation is, what is our response? Will we go to the party or won't we? Will we think more about who else will be there in a spirit of status seeking or will we think more about honoring our host? The other major shocker in this parable is what the king did after he was initially disrespected twice. And he said, the wedding is ready, but the first invitees were not worthy of sharing a meal with me and my son. So I want you to go therefore to the main streets. Literally, this says, go out to where the road ends, which is probably to the gates where people conducted their business, where the poor and the rich gathered, where the bad and the good gathered. And maybe even the people who'd already been invited, who went to turn away to their business pursuits, maybe they were at the gates hearing the invitation for a third time. And he says, listen, Everyone and anyone you can find, you invite. Slaves say, anybody? Yes, anyone and everyone, because I want my wedding hall to be filled. The inclusivity of the king is shocking. His willingness to sit at a meal, which symbolized abiding relationships with the rejects of life, is astounding. Again, people who hear this would not have believed that someone like this would do it. So listen to what I want to get across right now, because this is so important. This invitation is an exclusive invitation. Jesus alone is the Son of God. Jesus alone proved himself qualified 
to pay for our sin and separation from his Father. But his invitation is as inclusive as it can be. All may come. Whosoever will may come, the scripture says. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You know, Jesus was basically talking to two types of people in this crowd. One was the Pharisees, the self-righteous distancers who chose not to come toward him. And the second were the people who maybe deep down thought they weren't worthy of receiving an invitation like this. And they needed assurance that they really were included. Both people, both people groups were being compelled to come and to accept the invitation. One author said, we're taught that God's invitation has no place cards and no VIP passes. You see, parables were paradigm busters, shocking statements intended to reorient us toward God and toward ourselves and toward others. There's another whole sermon needing to be preached out of this about our attitude toward others that we might want to write off as not pursuing, not wanting to continue to ask or invite. And that's something that we have to have a check in our hearts about. But here's what I bet. I bet that if I sat down with every one of you I'm guessing that I would hear in your story that you may have said no to Jesus once or twice or maybe more before you ever said a real yes. Aren't you glad he kept inviting you? And he invites us always to reorientation through repentance. And under this third question of will we come or not, will we accept the invitation, we have to ask this of the parable. What do we do? with the harsh parts of the parable. Some invitees are destroyed, cities burned, a wedding guest gets tossed out due to improper attire. What do we do with those verses? Well, some interpreters have used this section of the gospel or have, or have spoken about this section of the gospel as an allegory, as a history of salvation. God initiates everything. He chose Israel to be his special people. Israel rejected his invitation. Uh, murderers killed all the prophets up to John the Baptist. The city of Jerusalem was burned in 70 AD. Uh, this vindicates the mission to the Gentiles and then also the great judgment. And there may be some truth to that. But if you take that approach only, it too easily relieves us from hearing Christ's invitation to us today. So here's what I think. The king will allow himself to be shamed. The king remains infinitely patient. The king will consort with the rejected and the poor, but not with the proud or the arrogant who wish to dictate the terms of their participation. Would it help you to know that the person who was not wearing the proper wedding robe that the verb talking about not being dressed in is in the middle voice. You say, what does that mean? Well, the active voice is the person does the acting um, on somebody else. Passive voice is I'm being acted upon. And the middle voice is I'm acting upon myself. In other words, he chose not to dress himself. And when the king or the host used the addressed friend or comrade, it was because that's what you said when you didn't know somebody's name. We even do that today. We don't know somebody's name at church. We go, hey, buddy, how are you? So he says, friend or comrade, how did you get in? He didn't know the man's name. The, guests, the guest was speechless, and that indicates that there are no excuses that we'll have when we stand before God. But his sheep, Jesus says, he knows by name. Those who have been called out of the kingdom of darkness and transferred to the kingdom of his beloved son are known by name. In the last book of the Bible, there are many passages of praise to the Father and the Son through the Spirit. I, if I had time, I'd love to read them all. But I want to encourage you to check out, go to Revelation and look at all the sections that are set off in poetic print 
and listen to those praises. But I do want to read this one in particular as I close. It's from Revelation 19, 6 through 9. Listen carefully. Hallelujah. For the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. To her it has been granted to be clothed with fine linen, pure and bright. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Based on everything we've said today, blessed are those who say yes to his gracious invitation every time they hear his voice. If we were together at this moment, we'd go right to the Lord's Supper, which Jesus gave us as a continual reminder that all who do say yes to him will one day sit down, literally sit down with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords around a table forever. Say yes to his invitation today in whatever way you're hearing it from this text or from the Spirit to you. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for hearing our voice as we cry to you. Thank you for welcoming us beyond what we could even imagine. Thank you for forgiving us even when we dishonor and disrespect you. When we don't give you your rightful place in our lives, we pray that as a sign of our repentance, we would turn toward you and, and say yes to whatever it is you're challenging us to say yes to in our lives these days. Thank you again for your spirit, for your word. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen.